Hello everyone, my name is Rashawn Chamel. I'll be your instructor for uh, the electronic field production class. So the point of this class is that not everyone who um, is interested in mass communications or multimedia communications, multimedia communications uh, wants to go into news. And there are a lot of other uh, ways that you can use those similar skills uh, and this class is to help introduce you to those things and give you some training in those. So whether it's commercials, documentaries, sports, whatever, um, there's uh, other uh, there's other ways of, of of you know making a living uh, aside from okay you're a mass comm major, multimedia communications major, you automatically go into news. This class is specifically for people who are interested in pretty much everything else that uses a video camera except news. So yeah, that's, um, yeah, th that, that's pretty much the overall gist of this class to help prepare you for those other things. Um, this, the way that the schedule will work is we'll have lectures generally on Monday, uh, probably Wednesday if we need to do any type of uh, lab activity, any type of uh, demonstration or, or shoot activity, those will gener generally be on Fridays. And it's not like there's one every week. So there's uh, a set number of shoots, I think it's about what, four or five? So yeah, it's not like every Friday you're gonna be you know, out shooting something. Uh, now, some of the projects that you do may take, you know, a couple of weeks to work on, and you could use maybe a Friday for that, but no, it won't be us meeting every single Friday. So, yeah. Um, oh, some things that you will need for this class. Um, since you will be doing video projects, you need a way of sharing that with me. So just uh, shooting and editing won't be enough. Uh, you'll have to be able to transfer and get that to me. And this tends to be a pro uh, problem uh, in some of my other classes, like say with Oralcom, where they had to videotape their speeches and all that. Um, so you'll need a, uh, some type of file sharing account, whether it's Dropbox, sorry, forgot to start my timer. Whether it's Dropbox or Google Drive, or something else because uh, you've taken, most of you have taken computer editing with me so you know that you can't email videos. You can email links, but you can't email a whole video. So you're gonna need to find some kind of way that, that you, uh, that you're you know comfortable with for sending me videos. Do not upload videos to Blackboard. So last I checked, which was this summer, it's still kind of, it's touch and go as far as what videos it will actually accept, and even if it accepts it, I may not be able to see it. So uh, until further notice, do not upload any videos to Blackboard. So better off Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever. Um, yeah, or if you know if we see each other in person, you can you know give it to me that way. Um, oh, on Blackboard, so, uh, with the lectures that I do, you can also find uh, the student version of the PowerPoints in Blackboard. So go into the Blackboard, this is Blackboard for EFP, and just go into the content section. <coughs> and this file right here is the student version of the PowerPoint that we'll be going over in just a moment. Um, yeah, there'll be some fill in the blanks. Most of you know me, so you know that type of style. So uh, you have that there if you wanna print it out in outline format or whatever, or just keep it as a PowerPoint slide presentation, whatever, you do whatever you want with it, okay? So uh, that's how you get your, you know, uh, your fill in the blanks and your study guides and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure you don't always wanna go back to a video uh, of me speaking to, you know, find out about what you need to know. Uh, also, uh, Remind, make sure that you join the Remind app. So the message that I sent out earlier, 
I just basically manually entered your names, uh, but that is not the class remind group. Join the class remind group because I, I probably won't be sending you out messages like that um, anymore. So, um, yeah, uh, join the class remind group. The, uh, the information will be in the syllabus, and I may, you know, put it somewhere else but you must join the class remind group. So yeah, that's how you get all the, the you know, that's the easiest way for me to send you announcements and yeah, it, it's one of the best ways to do it. So it's not even an option, join the remind group. Uh, let's get, so let's get into the first chapter. So, <clears throat> The first chapter uh, is pretty much telling you the difference between electronic field production and electronic news gathering. So EFP stands for electronic field. Anyway, uh, EFP by definition, hold on, let me pop this up so I can see it better. EFP by definition, uh, well, electronic field gathering, and the actual definition of it is, where is it? I know I put it in here somewhere. Well, somewhere in here, I've got the actual definition of it. It's basically using a camera for anything other than news. So, oh yeah, right there, using a video camera for a purpose other than news. That is the textbook definition of electronic field production. So, uh, it includes tons of things. So, actually there's more jobs in electronic field production than there are in news, even though most people think of uh, mass communications, you know, usually as news or, I don't know, public relations or something. So, uh, electronic news gathering, that's basically news. So, whether that's uh, using, whether it's by radio or by television or, uh, yeah, pretty much radio and television. Uh, yeah, using a video camera for, oh, using a video camera for broadcast news. So, yeah, no radio. Uh, what was I? Oh, yeah. So, you need to know these distinctions. Uh, aside from just the definition, there's also some values and priorities that uh, and how these two things differ. And, oh, and uh, by the way, chapter one is the shortest chapter of the entire course. So there's a good chance, um, there's a good chance I'll finish it today. Uh, if not, then it'll definitely get finished next time. So expect a test over chapter one next week. So, I don't know, maybe next Wednesday. Yeah, one slide in and I'm already giving you a test. Anyway, uh, so, uh, the background for how all this started. So, <clears throat> back in 1884, yeah, it was like, they had electricity in 1884, yeah. So, anyway, uh, it started working on how to transmit video uh, electrically. Uh, now, it took a while for this to actually get, you know, rolling. So. Uh, in 1926, mechanical video transmission, you know, occurred, and in 1939, uh, at the World's Fair. Now, the World's Fair is kind of like, how can I put it? Uh, Comic Con, uh, or some of, I, well, at Comic Con, you see usually like the trailers for like the next superhero movie or the the next uh, big video game thing is like. Uh, or maybe uh, the next new virtual headset or the PlayStation 5 or whatever. So it's like where they show off the new stuff. Uh, or maybe like, I don't know, if it was a car show, it'd be like some type of prototype car that probably will never get made or won't get made until like, you know, 20 years in the future or something. So this is where, that that's what they were thinking of. Well. That's how far-fetched it was, you know, at the time. People were working on it, but, I mean, for example, we still don't have flying cars, and they've been talking about that for who knows how long. So, anyway, where was I? Oh, so, <clears throat> early days of, of EFP, the cameras were just large, clumsy, and expensive. Kind of like with every piece of technology that has ever existed. So, whether it's a cell phone, a radio, uh, DVD player, um, everything started off, you know, large, clumsy, and expensive. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, 
Now, one of the things that helped make these cameras more accessible, uh, more just better, and you know, anyway, uh, easy to use for uh, more people um, is because with sports. So with sports, you can't just have these super duper, you know, transformer Megatron cameras because you got to be able to move. Uh, it's not just going to be just like a static like studio shot. So with like say sideline cameras, you can't have you know some big old bazooka uh, camera on the sideline. You need something a little bit smaller. And you're thinking, oh, cameras are still pretty big. Well, guess what? They were way bigger. So uh, yeah, by sports and uh, news. Uh, also, kind of a similar thing. Um, it's not like a, a setup where it's a camera mounted on the pedestal. It's, you know, you got to be able to, to run and gun, you know. So the news also uh, helped foster that, that, smaller, uh, that smaller camera um, idea. So <clears throat> in the last 55, more like 55, 60 years, uh, these are just some of the highlights of um, oh, of just cameras. So the Sony Porta Pack, which was this, uh, it was reel to reel. So I know you've seen maybe like some old film sprocket type stuff. Well, video cameras had kind of a, a, a similar, uh, similar thing. So black and white, heavy and cum cumbersome. Quality, of course, wasn't good. Uh, editing was just crazy on these things. Um, let's see what else did. Oh. 71, the Sony U-Matic, uh, the resolution was better. Uh, this was right around, yeah, this is around the cassette system, so uh, so it was, was it around, yeah, around the Betacam era, 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 era. So, um, now with this, it came in two pieces, uh, sorry, uh, that was the camera head and the CCU. So what that means is you had two pieces kind of, Kind of similar to, to this. Um, one part is just basically just the lens and, and capturing the, and you know, for basically capturing light. The other part was where you actually recorded and if you needed to make some, a few tweaks to it, you could. So it was still very huge. So like say this image right here, th this is all one piece. So it, it's, it's not, um, is not very convenient and it is it is heavy uh, let's see yeah it was better off using two people because you can't really get around that easily and also you know they had lots of um, lots of cables it, it, it just you know took a lot of setup it wasn't where you just pop up somewhere and you, you have that so you might need room just to fit through a door anyway so <clears throat> one thing that really helped with the whole um, the fast local live late breaking type mentality was the uh, was video video over film so in the old days well film was it film was all there was until about the time of the uh, the video cassette or the beta cam uh, and that basically gave a lot of advantages to uh, getting getting the images quicker so, which we are going to talk about now. So, with uh, the video cameras, they use videotape or video cassettes, huge video cassettes. Uh, film cameras use, you know, film. And the problem with uh, film, uh, well, the advantage that video had over film was that you didn't have to process it. What that means is that you just eject it and just plug it into a VCR or whatever and it would actually play. Now, film, it's kind of like old film cameras. If you've ever, n not these DSLR type, you know, digital cameras, but when you actually had a roll of film. Now, if you opened, if you, you know, shot a picture, then opened the back of that, opened the back hinge of that camera, and like, okay, well, I'm gonna go do something with this. As Soon as you open it, guess what? You just ruined your film. So, and even if you, even if you wound the, uh, the old 35 millimeter film and then ejected it, guess what? You still had to go take it to a dark room and develop it. So it still, it still wasn't ready. So it'd be, yeah, kind of like the difference between a video camera that uses cassette tapes versus, or, you know, 
versus a uh, still camera that uses old 35 millimeter film. Uh, and, and just loading that thing is just can be difficult. So uh, now film cameras did have a better image, uh, but it was way more expensive. And um, with video cameras, you, have, you had the option of broadcasting it live. Now that's huge. Um, that changed, that pretty much helped develop the, I say, but the news model ever since. So you still see promos today about, you know, live, local, late breaking. We were the first there, or the first to tell you about this particular thing. So they're still, you know, ha they still have the attitude of we broke the story, basically meaning we went out, we covered it, and we got it to you before everybody else. So that whole mentality came from the video era because that's that was its biggest advantage over film is that sometimes stuff that would take I don't know maybe a week or so to get you know to have video to have an image happens that day so <clears throat> excuse me So, uh, with this whole uh, revolution beginning on um, making cameras more accessible and faster and better and stronger and all that kind of stuff, um, 1976, this is when it's like you have this great idea, but it finally got implemented. So in 76, uh, video cameras were used to cover a pres uh, the presidential election. Now with this, reporters didn't have to wait for film to be developed. So what they shot that day went on the air that day. Before then, that, that, that just didn't happen. So, um, yeah, also, it allowed for live reporting. Now, you hear live, even when people aren't live, it's, it's a peeve, pet peeve of mine, someone gets in front of the camera, we're here live, and it's recorded, and it's not even gonna air until, you know, a day later or something, so a lot of amateur stuff. But anyway, um, the real live reporting, you know, that, that's when it first, you know, came about. Uh, 1970s, most stations were uh, switching to video, and <clears throat> of course, emphasizing that 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 latest information thing that I was telling you about. But because so many people were, and so many stations were starting to, to go that direction, things got cheaper. So the the cameras were lighter, better, and more reliable. I mean, just basically, uh, if everybody's buying these, and then more people are making them, but okay, people are gonna buy the better ones. They're gonna buy the cheaper ones, the ones that are easier to use. So that competition just made the, the growth of cameras even better. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I said that. Uh, cheaper, more accessible uh, to more users. Now, <clears throat> more accessible to more users, you know, one, just the, um, the, uh, the technology, the settings, uh, may, makes it, basically makes it easier for, for more users. Kind of like if you buy, and I pick on Walmart, on Walmart cameras or some other place where some dollar store camera, video camera, where it has just a lot of automatic settings and you might have a zoom and a record button and that's it, but that's accessible to more users. Now, say on a professional camera, you may not, you, you may have the zoom, the zoom toggle switch, but you also have the ability to manually zoom the camera. So it's just, um, yeah, it, it made things easier for, for more people. So you don't have to be a rocket science of, of, of camera videography uh, in order to use this thing. So once it became more accessible to, you know, uh, to more people, it, everybody was doing it, okay? It's kind of like, um, I don't know, just people taking pictures with their cell phones or those little cell phone, I, I forgot what they're called, like little images that you put on the picture. I forgot what it's like, the cat ears or the whatever. Um, yeah, I think at first it probably started with Apple, but now Samsung has it and it's just like, it's a common thing. So uh, more because it was more accessible, more people started to use it. And uh, just like, you know, everybody now is like an amateur photographer with their cell phone. Why? Because every cell phone has a camera on it. So there's more people interested in, you know, taking pictures now because it's so much easier. Anyway, um, and 
Yeah. Anyway, uh, so EFP is born because people are using cameras for everything. I mean, yeah, I, I think like the the Amer think of America's Funniest Home Videos. It was just people recording stuff, and then uh, yeah, something that kind of sucked back. You know, uh, late 80s, you know, early 90s, people used to have, at first they used to have vacation pictures. It was like a sign of middle class America. Then it came to uh, vacation videos where you go over somebody, you know, somebody maybe taking a trip somewhere and they got a video camera and you watch all this shaky, whipping the camera around, zooming in, zooming, fa zooming out, fast type video that lasts for like an hour. So, um, yeah, that sucked. Anyway, uh, but people, you know, there's a ton of, you know, amateur people with, video, with you know, halfway decent video equipment. <sighs> so, uh, 90s cameras became common to the general public, which basically created all that stuff I was telling you about. So, <clears throat> some ENG and EFP differences. So, uh, with ENG and EFP, they use the same equipment, but it's how you use those things. So, and how, you know, the different concerns that they have. So, EFP, using a video camera for, you know, purpose other than news, you know, weddings, educational videos, we talked about that. Now, something else about this is that those shoots are planned in advance. None, no EFP shoot is, is oh well I was just walking down the street and bam a commercial popped up and you know I, sh I shot the commercial one take and you know this is it no so you know when look at these examples weddings you know when the wedding is gonna occur if it's some kind of educational video like this eh, then you knew you know I didn't I didn't actually just walk into a room and was like oh I think I'll just start teaching no uh, commercials, same thing. So all of these things are planned in advance. So and they and it's not like uh, oh just we'll just shoot something, record something, and it'll it'll be good. And you know whatever image we get, we'll be happy with. No, people are pe these these things are are planned out, and they're they're expected to be of a quality of something that's actually planned out. Now uh, for electronic news gathering. Uh, using video for broadcast news. Now, sometimes um, things have gotten better uh, these days, but even in the early uh, camera phone days, uh, I know I'm starting to give away my age, but I remember when cell phones were called camera phones. The reason why they called camera phones because not every cell phone had, had a camera on it. So if it was a cell phone with the camera, it was called a camera phone. So, uh, and sometimes uh, when we have um, uh, news stations had footage from some viewer, some, not viewer, some witness that passed by or happened to, to snap a picture with their camera phone or, or the amateur videographer, guess what? They used it because of this mentality. Any image is better than no image at all. And, you, and I, I believe that also. So if you, you know, if you got a, you know, a fuzzy image of, uh, of a bear roaming the streets, that's better than just telling people, hey, a bear is roaming the streets. At least you got a, a shadowy, you know, image that you can squint your eyes at. So, uh, yeah, with news, uh, and I'm not just talking about just amateur footage, they're a lot more tolerant of what they'll allow. Now, I'm not talking about, say, in the studio, okay? Your studio stuff shouldn't, shouldn't look bad. But if, I don't know, say maybe the photog, you know, uh, gets to a, a scene and, I don't know, a fire or something, maybe they, they uh, the, maybe there's a lot of silhouettes, okay? You can't, you're having trouble seeing the firefighters because of the, you know, they're backlit, meaning the lights behind them, and you can't really see them, but you can see the fire, that, that, that's okay. Okay, if there's a heroic rescue, okay, well, at least we, at least we got a silhouette of the heroic rescue, you know? So, yeah, they're, they're a lot more uh, tolerant. Like, I don't know, if you've seen some of these, like this tornado chaser footage, you know, it's all shaky. You know, the, the, the wind is, you know, hitting the microphone so hard and they just, you know, allow that. But if you were shooting a commercial and it was windy outside, guess what? We don't want to hear that, that wind hitting the microphone. We still want it to sound silky smooth. Um, 
Now, with electronic news gathering, you also have to adapt to a location at a moment's notice. What does that mean? Well, sometimes a photog may be out on one particular type of story, and while they're out, they get called to another type of story. They can't say, oh, well, I didn't, I don't know, bring my tripod, or I left my portable light uh, back at the station. No, they, 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 they're going to need that stuff. And when I say portable light, I don't mean like uh, light that you, you know, stand up and do three-point light. Oh, we don't know three-point lighting yet. Um, some big rig, I'm talking about just at least something that you just, you know, mount to the top of your camera so you can, you know, get some kind of image. Um, also, um, yeah, it, you may have, um, I don't know, someone, a uh, reporter uh, in a dress, you know, a female reporter in a dress covering one thing, they, they get called out to some muddy field. Well, guess what? She, she better have some tennis shoes and some jeans in, in, in the vehicle so she can go cover that. So it's, um, it's not just the videographers, pretty much everybody has to be ready for whatever it may be. Also, that includes battery power. So if you're going to be out and you, you know, may have to cover more than one thing, you don't know, but you better have enough battery for what you originally were going to shoot and then some. So um, let's go over some of these uh, pre-production, production, and post-production differences. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, uh, some of the uh, concerns. Hold on, let me see. What am I doing on time? Yeah, I'm gonna almost finish. Okay, so with some of the uh, ENG concerns. So we're gonna talk about time, control, preparation, storyline, responsibility. So with ENG, your whole world centers around when is your deadline, okay? Your on-air deadline. So that means <clears throat> I, at the, no matter what it is that I'm doing, at the end of the day, I have to have this story or this script or whatever ready to go into the newscast. So, and that doesn't mean that I can just, you know, run up to whoever, you know, I don't know, 10 seconds before the newscast starts and say, here it is. No, no. So when um, those of you who know I was a news producer, and I'm trying to think, we printed rundowns maybe about 45 minutes to an hour before the, uh, before the show, and scripts, I think the latest you could print scripts was 30 minutes before the show. So by then you know it's it's locked in so you can't be uh throwing in you know it better be some you know something that should have been done you know way sooner and just now turning it in so you you had an idea you know within about an hour of what the what the newscast was going to be so the directors have to decide what shots and what cameras and anyway all that kind of stuff uh let's see oh so now, with this time um, concern, it affects everything. So sometimes you may not be able to cover a story because you can't get there and back within, within time. Or maybe not cover a story, but you may not be able to have it for the 6 o'clock news. Because of that, uh, it may end up having to be at the 10 o'clock news. And if you're trying to beat your competition, it's like, okay, well, maybe we'll bring a uh, microwave or a satellite truck out there so that way we don't have to worry about driving it back we'll just beam it uh to you know beam it to the station so that way uh we don't have to worry about the return time and be able to get it on the air also just number of interviews or how much time you spend on a scene trying to get interviews or trying to get information so sometimes you know you talk to you know two most important people and you just go because you got to get back or you got to go cover something else um, method of sending footage talked about that a little bit with uh, beaming the image so they have uh, news stations have things called satellite trucks or microwave trucks I'm trying to get too detailed but microwave trucks work by uh, line of sight so they have um, 
they call it a mast that they extend way high in the air and you have to know where your relay towers are and you have to actually point the dish at that relay tower and you know you beam it there and you know it gets to the TV station or satellite trucks have a big satellite dish and uh, I don't I can't tell you exactly where they point because I have never operated a satellite truck. I've operated a microwave truck, but you have to buy satellite time. So you, you, it actually goes into space, hits a satellite, bounces back to the station, and that's how you, you know, get your stuff. So anyway, uh, where was I? So uh, method, of, method of sending footage. Um, oh, control. Now with control, uh, <clears throat> You don't have control over, you know, people or places, or you don't have control over where the story is going to take place. You don't have control over, okay, you're in a room and it has some harsh overhead lighting, okay? Uh, or maybe it has very little lighting at all. Well, I hope you brought, hope you brought some kind of portable lights with you. Um, yeah, if, if one of the things that I tell my uh, TV production students is that when you get on the scene, one of one of the things you need to do first is get your interviews. I mean, sorry, not TV production, TV practicum, because people may not always be there, okay? So witnesses may not always be there. Uh, you can get the, an exterior of a building, but once that person is gone and that person may have known all about the situation or may, may have been able to express it in a way that captivates your audience, once they're gone, they're gone. So you have no, and you have no control over that. So I usually, uh, try to tell my TV practicum students if I do a training story with them is to you know get the stuff that's not always going to be there like say you're at some type of event and it's packed okay there's no <clears throat> or it's a good crowd okay 15 minutes from now that may not be okay you may not have that it may not look like the same experience so you, you get those people first because you know they may not always be there and you can't or don't manufacture a scene. What does that mean? Hold on. So, oh, I'm almost done, but I don't want to. Okay, so manufacturing a scene is, say you missed something. Um, well, let's say if you have somebody do something that, that didn't happen. So that that'd be manufacturing a scene. So yeah, uh, it's just making making up stuff. So you you, you don't do that. That that's unethical. Um, now <clears throat> preparation. Now I'll probably stop on this slide, even though I think we're like one or two slides from finishing. Um, so with preparation, you have to be prepared for it. You know everything we talked about that because you don't have you know a lot of control over certain things so the lighting you got to have you know bring some type of extra lighting just in case clothing uh, maybe might be doing like a baseball game but then you go to some type of formal black tie thing so you need at least have you know a full button-down shirt also having enough tape I've been in situations well I've been while I was working I've been around certain situations where photogs run out of tape and somebody has to actually drive to the scene just to give somebody a tape. Um, yeah, so you do want to have, you know, enough for what you plan on using and, and then some. Uh, let me see. Something. Huh. Uh, okay. So looking at my uh, slides and I think looking at my slides and uh, yeah that there's still a little bit left so uh, I'm gonna continue uh, with chapter one uh, later this week most likely Wednesday but don't hold me to it um, so yeah uh, yeah if you I guess have questions or something email me uh, and I'll see you guys later.